All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the patience. Um, as we dealt with a couple of technical difficulties, um, we're going to let a couple more people join in on the webinar here for a second. So we'll go ahead and get started in about 30 seconds. Um, while we are waiting, if anybody wants to drop a location in the, uh, the chat, um, now would be a great time to do that. We always love to see where you guys are calling in from. So Take a second and find your chat feature and uh, tell us where you're from, where you're calling in from. Springfield, Illinois. Love it. Haven't been to the, the good old Illinois capital in a long time. <laughs> Fort Wayne. Awesome. Wausau. Hi, Corinne. Good to see your name on here. Love to have you. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for joining us today. Um, keep using that chat feature as you're going through it. I'm going to get started here so we don't lose too much time. Um, but again, thanks for joining us. We have a Wrenchway and Hierology webinar today, um, attracting more young people to your dealership and mistakes to avoid when working with local automotive programs. So really excited about this topic. I'm going to jump right in and we'll we'll get into some more details here. So real quick, rules of the road, you can see on the screen, we've got a couple of features. You're already using the chat feature. Thank you so much for that. So keep using the chat feature to communicate with each other, have conversations amongst each other. We'd love to see that chat happening um, and seeing some conversation in there. If you need to ask uh, myself or Jay a question at any point during the webinar, use the um, use the uh, Q and a, thank you. Use the Q and a feature. Um, we'll get notified of that and we'll be able to answer your question as we go through it. Um, and then also, um, this is being recorded. So you will all get a link to the recording and also the slides after the presentation today. So no need to, um, take too many notes though. We're happy if you do, but you'll get a, a copy of this in your email tomorrow. Okay, so getting started, since I'm already talking, I'll introduce myself. My name is Tiffany and I am calling in from Hireology. For those of you that aren't familiar with Hireology, we're an applicant tracking system and we specialize in automotive hiring. We've been around for about 10 years now and our main goal and focus is to help dealerships hire better talent and keep that talent. Um, and I've been at Hireology for just about two and a half years. And prior to starting here, I spent about eight and a half years at Ford Motor Company in Chicago. So all in all, I've got about 11 years of automotive experience. And I'm really excited to be here with Jay today to dig into our content. I'm Jay. finally here. I was I was kind of the reason <laughs> for the technical difficulty. I, I apologize for the delay, but uh, I am so delighted to be here with everybody. Tiffany did such a fantastic job with some of the housekeeping things, I think she does a much better job than I normally do. So kudos to you, Tiffany. But oh, uh, thank for you those so much. You, <laughs> for those of you that don't know me, my name is Jay Ganinen. and uh, I'm one of the co-founders here at Wrenchway. And uh, everything we do is around technicians, right? And so today's conversation is really, really exciting for me because I feel like the school piece is oftentimes a very underrated piece of the recruiting process. So uh, really, really excited to be joined by Tiffany today and uh, ready to get this thing rolling. Awesome. Um, cool. So before we get into the content for today, I want to give a little bit of uh, context to why Hireology and Wrenchway are doing this together. Um, and Hireology and Wrenchway, we've been partners since about April of this year. And part of our partnership is really to help our mutual customers more seamlessly hire technician, um, technician talent. And when a job is posted on Hireology, uh, it automatically gets posted to Indeed, ZipRecruiter, career site, uh, LinkedIn, a bunch of other sites as well. And we also automatically post that job to Wrenchway. So the goal of that is when a technician applies to a job from the Wrenchway site, it automatically comes back into Hireology as well. So the goal of that is really to make your jobs a little bit easier and make you have to manage less websites when it comes down to your hiring practices. So if you have any questions about Hireology, I know some of you guys are mutual customers of both of ours, some of uh, just Hireology, just Wrenchway. If you have any questions, you know, feel free to put it into the Q&A like I mentioned, um, or you can also reach out to Jay and I. We'll put our contact information here at the end of the slides as well. Okay. 
So our agenda for today, like I said, topic that I'm excited to kind of dig into with everybody. Um, number one, benefits of working with local schools. You guys hear it all the time, but there's a ton of schools out there that need your help. And there, it is a two-way street there. There's benefits on both sides. So we're going to get into that. We'll go into some missteps to avoid when building your educational partnerships. We'll take some best practices for building partnerships with local schools and also how to increase your efficiency with Wrenchway School Assist. And then we'll finish with some case studies and we'll probably have time for some Q&A as well. Um, so with that, let's take it away. Um, Jay, Wrenchway is the expert when it comes to helping local deal or helping dealers connect with local schools. So do you want to start with sharing some of the benefits of working with local schools? Yeah, I think as we go through this section specifically, we do want to kind of dive into the why, right? Why is it important to really focus on this younger generation? And especially as it relates to technicians, because we all know technicians are really, really hard to find. I think a lot of times what happens is we get stuck in our day-to-day -day lives and putting out the fires of each day, and it doesn't become the priority that it needs to. And so as we walk through this, we really do want to focus on the why and a little bit of the how as well. Uh, I want to start by really laying out the current landscape of education and as it relates to technical programs primarily. Uh, we deal with both the high school and post-secondary level. And so as we go through these slides, you'll kind of notice maybe there are some differences between the support needed at a high school level versus a, a, a post-secondary technical school level. And so we're going to start with the good and the bad. The first uh, is the good. And with the Gen Z, as they've been coined the tool belt generation, I, I think we are seeing an uptick in interest in the trades. Now, that can be a good and a bad thing, right? And what you'd say, why Why is there a bad? Well, when we're going and we're battling for those, those students getting into the trades, we're not just battling with other automotive and and and. Uh, diesel dealerships. We're, we're really battling with the other trades as well. Electricians, plumbers, contractors, they're being paid very, very well right now. And we have to stand out to those folks. But you can see there's been an uptick of 16% enrollment uh, from 2022 to 2023. And the number of students studying vehicle maintenance and repair increased by 7%. So we are starting to see maybe an increased interest in our industry. Now, is that enough to fill the gap that's left by all of the baby boomers that are currently retiring? Probably not, right? We're still kind of in that hole that we're trying to dig ourselves out of. And that's a real challenge. And you all feel it each and every day in your dealership. So something to really keep an eye on. And the bad part, and I, I hate saying bad, right? Because it kind of almost has this negative connotation that we're going down this road of being negative. But there are some realities that we have to face as it relates to education. One is the funding in these programs, especially at the high school level. A lot of these high school programs are struggling to survive and they're struggling for budget. And there's also an instructor shortage along with that. And this might not be something that impacts you on a daily basis, but if you look at this from that 30,000 foot view, if we're struggling to get instructors in the door to educate our next generation of technicians and really any staff, that's a big deal, right? If we don't have people there to be able to actually educate these, these students, we're setting ourselves up for an even more negative future. And we don't want that. We want to be at the core level of trying to fix that. And for those of you that are joining us for this webinar, you're part of the solution, right? The fact that you took time out of your busy days to join us to talk about schools kind of shows your level of commitment to school. So I think as we talk about this, there'll be a lot of opportunity for each of you to really have an impact on these programs and on these students and on these teachers that will really kind of leave a legacy for future generations. Yeah. And you say you don't want to call it the bad. And I agree with that. But like, honestly, in this scenario, the good, in my opinion, like outweighs the bad a little bit. I feel like we were yeah. dealing with such a long time of people just not entering into the workforce. And I'm really excited to see those metrics there, even though they're not going to totally fill the gap. I'm just excited to see progress. So that's progress, my right? We celebrate <laughs> progress. Yes. Right. Um, there we go. Um, so right. in, to, to Jay's point, you know, without proper funding um and with some of these the bad and stuff like that that jay mentioned you know 
if there isn't enough funding, it's going to impact your students enrolling in schools and it's going to impact the actual education that the students are getting. And without proper funding, generally student enrollment decreases. And it's mainly because schools really, sometimes they can't keep up with the programs necessarily and market themselves to students. And it also leads to education then being compromised as well. And if there isn't enough funding, you can't pay your instructors. And if you can't pay your top tier instructors, then the overall level of education is naturally just going to go down a little bit as well. Um, and it, you know, like Jay mentioned, we're, we're currently in a teacher shortage. So this all adds up as, as part of the impact on the dealerships then in turn. And, um, kind of continuing on that thought too, less instructors kind of means one of two things, either they have more students and their focus on those individual students goes down a little bit, or the school sometimes might limit entry into the program and thus less money is flowing into the program as well. And when you think about the impact of schools on dealerships, less techs entering tech schools means less techs for you to choose from around graduation time. And, you know, it honestly means that these techs also have possibly a lower skill set because they didn't get the attention that they needed during school. So too few teacher or too, few, or too low of caliber teachers, sometimes it's significantly, significantly going to impact the students coming out of school. So I think the, the big thing that I think about with this is it really requires foresight to plan for this issue. And it, if we get too far behind, then we just can't recover from it. Um, and one thing that Jay and I kind of talked about is uh, if you have a great tech that is aging out of the shop and you don't know how to keep them engaged at your stores or in the business in general, but you want to keep them engaged, there could be a really good opportunity for you to encourage them to be a teacher at your local school and sometimes that gets a little bit testy because you're going to lose some productivity at the shop. But if they're thinking about leaving and retiring anyways, then you get a little bit out of it. And like, honestly, what better advertising could you really have than if you have a former tech of yours or current tech of yours that's in teaching students? And it's very impactful when you think about that. Amen. And I think there there's so much value in creating your own pipeline by doing that, right? Uh, just to what you said. If somebody knows your culture and knows your business inside and out and has been with you for a long time, it might just be done in the shop. There might be a great opportunity for them to, to put their hand up and be able to, to really go run a program and do something that maybe they're passionate about. The other point that I want to add there, and it, it's to that first point, when, when there isn't enough funding and instructors, the program obviously struggles. Uh, a common theme that we see throughout the industry and really on the education side is what happens oftentimes with this uh, teacher shortage is that you'll wait, uh, basically a tech school will wait or a high school will wait until the uh, teacher says, hey, I'm going to retire. They post a job. It's kind of similar to some of the stuff we see on the technician recruiting side, but at, at the school level. But when they post that job, they just kind of post it to their state website and there might not be a lot of interest in it. And what happens is that as there's less visibility of a teacher being the lead of that program, there's less funding coming toward that program. There's less student interest in that high school program, especially high school program. And then it just becomes a really expensive program with not a lot of interest. And so when that goes to the school board level, what happens is that they get cut, right? Because it is an expensive program to run. And that's really why we need industry to step up. We need industry to be involved in a lot of those conversations. We need industry involved from the standpoint of if there is a shortage of a teacher, really working our tails off to help them find that next teacher. A lot of times they don't even need that four-year education anymore. They can use their technical background to parlay that into an educational opportunity the, the important part here is that when you have a program that starts to go down that road, you have to be all hands on deck. You have to work with your competitors. You have to work with everybody in the industry to make sure that school gets a teacher back in it, because we've seen that slippery slope happen over and over and over again across the country. And when that teacher starts to retire and they don't have an obvious replacement there, that program is in jeopardy of being cut and we cannot afford as, as an industry to have that happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to that point kind of segues into benefits of helping local schools. I think the benefits are fairly obvious, but we don't think about them very often. I think one of the things that throughout my career, I've, I've really 
focused on and really tried to put a lot of effort into is that first point of building lasting relationships with instructors. I, I've had so many good relationships with these people that really trust me. I think they'll tell me things that maybe they wouldn't tell other people. And they tell me about the frustrations that they have with industry. They tell me about when they need support and, and they can't seem to get it. And they, the focus from industry so often, we'll talk about this in a future slide here, but the focus from industry is oftentimes just on that one student rather than the program. And without a strong program, you're just not going to get that one student that you need. So being able to really build that relationship with an instructor at a personal level. Uh, I know for myself, I probably had a half a dozen instructors at my wedding uh, 10 years ago, right? Like <laughs> I, I really, really, uh, I, I should correct that 11 years ago, not 10, 11. I, I'll get in trouble for that. So I've got to make That's sure important. I this is recorded, yeah. you know? Yeah, this is recorded. <laughs> this is recorded. Although I doubt my wife is ever going to watch anything on, uh, on our industry, but no. uh, number two point is uh, create a pipeline of young talent. Obviously that relationship that you build with that instructor is very important when, uh, and from a selfish standpoint of you are trying to grow that young technician pipeline without that relationship. It's oftentimes it's hard to get in front of the crowd. It's hard to get out of the noise to be that obvious choice for that young student. It also does help you work directly with the students in building that awareness. And I, I like when dealerships go into a school or any shop for that matter, go into a school and they're talking about the industry, not necessarily about their specific job opportunity, not even specifically about their, their dealership, but the opportunities in this industry to grow a really, really great career. And when we focus on that, I think it, really, I, I think it creates some camaraderie, right? It, it creates maybe more questions than just what, what is your benefits package? It, it really does create conversation around why somebody should uh, choose to come into our industry. Again, they have choices of what industry they want to go into. We need to be the obvious choice. That's the way to get in front of them. Uh, that fourth point, improve community trust and loyalty. I do think getting your brand out there and your badge in front of a school and constantly working with that school helps put you in, in maybe a better light than others and helps you build trust, which could ultimately end up leading to more sales, even on the new car side, right? So I, I think there's there's a lot of value there. And then the last point, and this is one that I've been surprised with over the years are the amount of technicians that would love to go speak to a class. Not every technician is going to love going and speaking to a class, but there are so many that have reached out to me, sent me a message and saying, Hey, I'd love to do this, but my dealership never gives me the opportunity to go talk to a class. Uh, they expect me to be in my bay hundred percent of the time producing. I would love to go out and talk to a class. Even uh, some of these technicians have, have told me I would go at night. I would go on a weekend. I, they just are passionate about the industry and they want to get out there. Why are we holding them back? Let them get out there and talk to schools. Yeah, and I think that is such a valuable point too. Hyrology puts out research every year based on what applicants are saying and applicants want career growth. Applicants want to know that they are making a difference and that's no different obviously for your employees as well. So when you think about creating leadership opportunity, like this is something that you could be say like thank you so much for your hard work. Like you know what you're talking about. Like this is an honor to go work with the school. So I think the the framing of that too can really be helpful. A lot of people might be scared of it, like you said, or not interested in it, but sometimes the framing of it, it just takes a little different vantage in it. I think it could go a long way. Absolutely. Um, so that makes sense. The benefits of working with schools, tons of sense, but what about mistakes to avoid? Because it's not all, you know, easy every single time. So what, what should uh, dealerships avoid? when working with schools? I think there's some blind spots that we have and sometimes they're obvious blind spots. Sometimes they're not so obvious. Uh, I'll start with, as I mentioned before, with my relationship with a lot of these instructors and some of the, the stuff they talk to me about, this number one might be the one that I hear the most, which is they get so annoyed when a shop calls at graduation time that has been non-existent in their program and asks for their best student. And I, I've referred to this story in the past, but it's one of my favorites in that 
I was at a, a local tech school and one of the, the instructors pulled me into his office and said, it was around graduation time. I think it was like May. And he said, listen to my voicemail. And he had 17 voicemails from shops asking for his best student. And I think they were graduating a total of 12 in that program that year. And so that's just the people that are calling at graduation time and asking. He said 90% of those have, I, I, ha I have no relationship with. I haven't talked to them. I don't know who they are. And yet here they are in my voicemail asking for our best student. And so when you look at it through an instructor's lens, that is a major pet peeve. And for, for, because we've got this dealership audience, I, I love to use this analogy, which is, and really it's just a, a simple comparison. I view this relationship very similar to a sales manager, service manager relationship. In a lot of times, a service manager will be sitting there working at their desk and they see the sales manager coming around the corner and they're like, oh, what does this person need now, right? It's not because the sales manager's coming around the corner to say, hope you're having a good day. <laughs> I, I, let, let's talk some football or something. No, it normally is because they need something. And I think schools think the same way, right? There are a lot of shops that only show up at graduation time or when they need something and aren't there to help build the program. And that drives instructors nuts. It would drive me nuts too. So that's like, that's a verifiable, I, I would say for sure. <laughs> the second point is signing up, but not showing up. And what we mean by this is oftentimes we'll go to an advisory committee meeting. We'll go to a career fair. We'll go somewhere for the school, but we're not actually actively participating. And I've been in so, so many advisory committee meetings over the years. And a lot of times it's frustrating because their school led, of course. And in those meetings, a lot of times we, you know, talk about curriculum, talk about some, some very base level things, but don't really get into the core. Hey, if our enrollment stinks, that should be our number one thing we're talking about. Right. But I think what happens a lot of times, uh, uh, people either don't want to give their secrets to their competitors. So they stay quiet or, and when they say secrets, it's always funny because I'll hear these, these stories and secrets. And I'm like, it's not, it's not that it's not rocket science, right? Like what you're doing is cool, but don't let that hold you back from actually participating in the advisory committee meeting. And at some level, push the, the instructors a little bit. Right. And what I mean by that is ask them clarifying questions, make sure that you truly understand where their program is at from a health standpoint and really try to identify those opportunities for your organization and for you as an individual to get in there and help out. Without that, it can easily turn into that check the box type of activity, which is not what we need in our industry. That's not what we need in our schools. We need active participation from both sides. So it isn't just going in, taking, taking roll call, uh, walking through curriculum and then getting lunch and not talking to each other for another six months. We, we need to be active participants in these advisory committees and really any time a school is asking us to step up. Yeah. And I, I kind of want to jump in on the next two, because I feel like all four of these sort of build upon one another and I get it, you know, what you're talking about makes sense. Like we all really get busy, but you know, when we let schools fall to the bottom of the priority list, it's kind of like what I talked about a few slides ago, uh, slides ago. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, you have to remember where your priorities lie. And if you make a commitment to a school, just make sure that you are actually going to help them. It's just so easy to push things to the side that you don't see immediate impact from. But try not to forget the why behind what you're doing. And, you know, you're not seeing necessarily like the immediate satisfaction that you get from when you're helping a customer, for example, um, and your service department. And even with, with hiring, you know, sometimes the ROI takes a little bit longer to come to fruition anyways. So it's sometimes it's, it's hard to make it, you know, the number one priority, but helping students and engaging with schools, it, it takes longer to show positive effects, but really in the long term, it's so worth your time. And I see a ton of dealers who are either not involved at all or only service level involved when it's surface level involved when it comes to, you know, working with schools. And saying that you're just going to partner with the school means nothing. If your name is just on a list or you make that phone call at the end of the year, you need to do more. 
um, just being involved, it just doesn't cut it when you think about what some of your other dealership competitors might be doing instead. So you need to make sure to stand out for your brand and make yourself stand out at the schools by, by not letting that fall to the bottom of the priority list. So it sounds a little preachy, right? But, you know, make your set of priorities at the beginning of the year and make schools a part of it. And then actually, like, I think the thing that sticks out to me the most is if you think about making that school a priority, watching a kid really grow into him or herself can be so rewarding. And if you are part of helping them grow along the way, I think it just makes all the difference in the world as well. And last one of the mistakes to avoid is being inconsistent. And like I said, these all kind of build upon one another, but it's again, similar to what I talked about, but it's doing something one time and then not doing it again for months. So you do something with the school for a few weeks and then you just fall off the schedule. You only show up when you need something. So practice being consistently present in general. Um, it can be something small, like dropping in to grab donuts for the students, saying hi, you know, maybe stop in during finals week to just make sure that your face is known. Just think about different things that you can do on a more regular basis, even if they're small, just to sort of get your name, your face, your dealership out there. And think about things that are maybe unexpected, but easy for you to do for the schools and just get on their good side, right? Figure out a way that you can encourage them to think of you when the time comes and it is graduation time and you do make that phone call. Um, really, it's the perception of the school that matters when they want to help you with their students. So best practices. Um, we know what not to do with those mistakes, but what do we do instead, Jay? This first point is one that I think we as an industry really, really need to focus on. And it's really hard because a lot of us are short people in our dealerships and it can be really easy again to put things on the back burner or in this scenario, we look at it and we say, okay, all of these shops are showing up at graduation time asking for a student. You're just so focused on that one person, on that one student but if we as an industry can shift our focus to improving the program and making the program so strong that really everybody gets technicians, right? If we have a strong program, we should be putting out a lot more students than maybe we are in some of these really, really good programs, but maybe underfunded programs or under supported programs. But if we can shift our frame of thinking to, to thinking about the program as a whole, I think you get more quality students. And I, I, I think it just, it takes the whole dealership to buy into that too, right? Because if you're just solely focused on that one person, you're just going to continually chase your tail forever. And if if you focus on that program, hopefully you don't have to do that. The other piece there is uh, just to what Tiffany was just saying with get involved and stay involved throughout the entire academic year. When she mentioned the, the example about donuts or pizza or whatever, I know a lot of times you'll see technicians kind of poking fun at that on social media, but it is really, really nice. And a lot of times, I, I think we've all been uh, high schoolers, college age students where if somebody brought in some food, uh, that would be really, really nice, right? Like you, you were hungry. You want you want that food. Free food. So, it speaks volumes. Yeah. It does. <laughs> it does. You could you could get directly to a student's heart with food. I can guarantee it. But being able to really just use those as opportunities to get into the program. It's not necessarily about the donuts themselves, right? It really is a door opening for you to get in, make your face familiar to those students. Like we just had a. Uh, an individual by the name of Mike Wyant on our beyond the wrench podcast. He does it better than I think anybody I've ever met. And he is present and does some really, really cool things. I'd encourage you to listen to the podcast. He has a whole different level of enthusiasm for it. Not saying you have to be at that level, but at least look for opportunities to get into the school and talk to the students, talk to the instructors, even to the deans of the programs, right? At the tech school level, a lot of times, you might end up talking to that dean and the, the unfortunate part is those deans tend to change over and over again, but being able to develop relationships with them so you can have that maybe more difficult conversation when the time comes, just being present helps so much. And then lastly, if you commit to something, actually follow through. I think this is good life advice in general, but when you're working with a school, 
being able to, to follow through with your promises is so, so important. And I kind of joked with Tiffany in our pre-meeting for this, that I just always kind of go back for any of you that have ever watched the office. There's a, uh, uh, there's an episode where Michael Scott promises scholarships to this entire school, and then they grow up and he actually has to try and come up with the money to pay for their scholarships or tell them that they're not getting scholarships. So Scott's tots, thank you for the, uh, somebody <laughs> understanding my reference there. Uh, but just, if you're going to say, if you're going to commit to something, make sure you follow through with it. Yeah. And I kind of want to go back to your first, your first bullet there too. When you're thinking about mindset and mindset shift, you know, in hiring at Hireology, we talk about how um, it's more than hiring. Hiring is sort of like a one-time action. You need to make a hire, you find somebody and you fill the role and recruiting is sort of that always on approach. Um, And it's really changing your mindset. So you meet somebody, it's maybe not the right time, keep them in the Rolodex, maybe keep them warm for when you do need somebody. And I think working with the schools is like that too. Again, it goes back to like an always on approach. What can you do on a regular consistent basis? Um, And I think it's gonna work wonders. And for some more tips for working with schools. Uh (laughs) All right. I, I, I've missed my slide here, uh, but <laughs> a, a, making it a priority. I think that first point there, make it a talking point in your regular meetings. I, I can't stress this one enough. It's really easy to do, but it's really easy to forget. If you make an, a, an agenda item on your meetings, you make sure that it's at least talked about who's gone to see the schools, uh, what types of relationships do you have? And that second point, add reminders to your calendar, very, very simple to do. And sometimes it's hard to keep an eye on our calendar, but if you are like me and you're looking at your calendar each and every day, each and every hour, each and every minute, you're going to see those reminders and really, hopefully that triggers something. It's not just another task on your calendar of something like, oh, I'll get to it eventually. Make sure you prioritize it. Make sure you have those conversations. And The finding the preferred contact method and time, this is hard to do. A lot of times, if you're not working with that school very often, or maybe you don't have that relationship with them, that can become a really, really big barrier. I think we see this a lot when we do get a new instructor in a program who's not overly familiar with who their community partners are. And ultimately, I think that costs you in in being able to even develop that relationship or start the relationship with them. So making sure that you know who the instructors are, I recommend that you do this both at the high school and post-secondary level. We do have some dealerships that are now getting into the middle school level, which is scary, but uh, I know here locally, we actually have the students picking their career paths in eighth grade. So you're going all the way back to eighth grade to pick a career path because that's going to dictate what classes they get in high school. So that kind of tells you how early we have to get in. And there are, there's a bunch of data that suggests that if you, the earlier you get in and influence that student, the more likely they are to come work in our industry, maybe even for you, but it all comes down to just knowing who that person is to reach out to and making sure that you always have your your uh, finger on the pulse of that program. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm excited to, to kind of hear more about this because those tips kind of come into play with uh, school assist. So you want to take a, a second to talk about how school assist can help? Yeah, absolutely. I, the funny part about school assist was it wasn't a part of the initial platform when we built Wrenchway. And the more and more we worked with shops, we started to get that feeling that there was a huge desire for the dealerships to have better relationships with schools. And oftentimes it came down to that there just wasn't enough time, right? And so we came up with a solution to really streamline that. And so we have over a thousand schools on the platform. Excuse me one second. I had a drink of water. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, We have over a thousand schools on the platform. I think we're close to 1100 now. We actually, I think about a year and a half ago, only had 150 schools on the platform. So that has dramatically grown. It's the fastest growing part of our platform. And what it does is gives schools, both high schools and post-secondary technical schools, 
uh, the ability to just ask for things, right? So what they need to support their program, it could be somebody to come speak to a class. It could be a donation of some type. Whatever they need, they can go out to Wrenchway School Assist and be able to ask for it. And what it does for you at the dealership side is it gives you the access to that direct contact, uh, the person that you need to get to in the program. Uh, we just talked about that in the slide prior, that that oftentimes is a barrier. Well, the person that set up the account is who you're messaging. So you're not trying to go through the red tape of administration and trying to get to the right person. Uh, you can message them directly. Uh, the instructors, uh, one of the really cool parts, I think, is that we're getting more and more instructors to post program updates. Uh, so they they can go on and just give you an update of where they stand as a program. I really look forward to how we're going to grow that part because I think that is really, really essential for all of us in industry to, to keep tabs on these programs. Uh, but that's also where they can go in and they can request for those resources. So they can post it. Uh, you can kind of see a screen grab here where uh, it's just kind of an example of somebody looking for guest speakers. If you wanted to volunteer to be a guest speaker at that program, just uh, fire off a message and start the conversation back and forth. Again, it's not necessarily just about being the guest speaker. It's about growing that relationship. And any touch point you can have with a school is really helpful. That allows you to do that. Uh, dealerships can list a, a, available resources that you might have. We've had some really cool uh, uh, stories and we've got some case studies coming up that we'll be able to share with you uh, of different examples because it's not just that one thing that you think, you know, oh, the schools always need that. There's a bunch of things that schools need. Uh, but again, message directly on the platform and it keeps your conversations out there, which I kind of like because then it doesn't get buried in email and kind of you know, where you, it leads you to trying to hunt for what conversation you were having with the school. Uh, all of that is housed on the school assist side. Yeah, I love tool. this tool. Sorry, I feel like, no, I feel like this tool is really fun. And I want to just pause for a quick second. We had a good question come through for you, Jay, that I think will also answer, answer a little bit on the next slide, but I'll, I'll read it now. Um, so Corinne asked a good question. We're, we're doing all of these things, literally all of them. And I believe it because Corinne, Corinne crushes it. Um, but she says she needs a level up move at this point. She says she has multiple dealers in a small area pooling for the same kids. And she's looking for a suggestion to level up. So you know, I'll let you kind of speak to that. I think we kind of talked to it on the next slide, but any, any thoughts to add before we go into that next slide? That's a fantastic question. And I think part of it is depending on your geographic location, right? If you have a bunch of stores in a cluster, that might mean that you're in a bigger geographic area. If you find yourself in that scenario, that situation, one of the things I like is uh, spreading your wings amongst multiple schools, right? So not just focusing on that one school or maybe having that one dealership own that one school, right? Being able to kind of allocate it out to where you've got a, uh, a, a program where this Chevy dealership, for example, is connected with this school and that's kind of their school. They, they've kind of taken that one under their wing. I think the principles behind that are really nice because then it kind of gives you clear guidance. Now, if that Chevy dealership happens to own that school for you, but you have a, a student coming up that maybe wants to be a Eurotech, obviously you have a really nice transition over to one of your other dealerships. So I, I think it's really about kind of mapping out that plan, getting clarity on it. That can see, seem a little bit overwhelming then, right? Because now you're going from focusing on one school to a bunch of schools, but I think that's where Wrenchway can really, really help out because that should be able to then allow you to kind of have visibility to all of those schools and maybe be able to say, hey, Mr. Chevy general manager you're, or, or service manager, you're not doing anything with this school. Can you please go talk to them? Can you please go try to establish a relationship? Because then you're focused on that one. And I do think it drives maybe a little bit more accountability for your teams and the different brands that you have to develop those relationships and not just defer to uh, the recruiting department or the human resources department that, that they're going to take care of it. I don't have to worry about it. No, we need some buy-in from you at your singular location as well. We need you to be involved 
because if we don't get that, it makes my job exponentially harder. So hopefully that makes sense. But it's really, I think, extending your outreach beyond just that one school or those couple schools into getting uh, really a, a bigger top of funnel. Um, I would also encourage anybody that's that's listening right now, I know it gets a little competitive to share secrets and things like that, but if you do have anything that's worked especially well for, for getting involved with schools, we're going to flip to the next slide and talk about it. But if anybody wants to share, I encourage you to add to the chat. Um, and one other question came through, and then we'll we'll flip to that next slide. Um, do you have Reach in Canada, Hierology? For, uh, for first, we do have Reach in Canada, so we do have customers in Canada, but Jay, can you speak to Wrenchway in Canada? We do not as of yet. And I hate answering that question because Sorry. I know my, no, <laughs> no, it's a great question. And I think as we, as we grow and expand, obviously we want to get to our friends in Canada because we hear a lot of the demand up there. And, and so some of it is uh, just as we're growing, I feel like that's a, a natural progression for us and we do need to get up there. Uh, but uh, hopefully, hopefully soon, hopefully soon. Okay. All right, we'll let you off the hook for now on that one, and we'll flip over <laughs> to different ways to to help schools. So kind of two different ways uh, we we bucketed these. One is improve the program. The other is improve the student experience. Um, and I think there's so many opportunities for both, right? And when you when you view these, what I would challenge all of you to do is let this kind of maybe expand your mind a little bit and expand really what your your traditional thinking is of what you can do to help a school. So if it is that a school is needing advisory committee members, which we have a pile of those requests out there on school assist right now, uh, make sure you sign up. And, and similar to the point earlier in the presentation, don't just show up, be an active participant, really show that you care about their program. Uh, consumables, uh, one of the crazy parts, and especially at the high school level, when they're lacking budget, something as simple as shop towels can have a huge impact on a high school program so that instructor's not buying it out of their own pocket. And my, my wife's an elementary school teacher. I know how much money these teachers put into their programs. And this is something where, to me, it's very low hanging fruit. How do, how do we get in there and make sure that they have you know, the towels, the, the soap, the, you know, whatever it is that they're going to go through pretty frequently so that they don't have to spend their budget on it. Uh, training materials. One thing I'd caution with training materials is be aware of what training materials they already have. I, one common thing I'm seeing from a lot of the OEMs right now, as well as some of the aftermarket uh, parts distributors is that they're all saying, well, here's our university, our online university. And they think that that's what's going to separate them. But what's happening is they're, they're almost living with blinders on, right? Where they don't understand that everybody else is also giving them their university. And so that one thing that you think you're giving them that's that's great, maybe isn't the greatest. Now, I think that that next point, the fourth point, demonstration parts, vehicles, and equipment, this is where I think there's a, a, a way to level up right there is that if you've got that vehicle that would typically be donated to Rawhide, no offense to Rawhide, great organization, but if you could possibly take that vehicle and donate it to your local school, there's then an opportunity to maybe tag team that with a technician, send a technician with the car and maybe come up with some exercises. I know one of the things that I was talking to our local high school about was doing a, an inspection workshop. And so if you sent the vehicle over, you could go through a thorough inspection of the vehicle with the students that benefits, even the students that aren't going into this industry, right? If, if they can understand what they, what it is that they need to, uh, to be looking at. Uh, I, I think there's over and above training materials. There's just training that we can do with both the students and the instructors that is really, really helpful. And subject, subject matter experts to handle specialized modules such as EV, obviously that's a hot topic thing right now. Uh, I know there's a lot of desire from schools to get more education on EV, the hybrids, ASE test prep. Uh, I think a lot of tech school programs do a really nice job of that. Uh, a lot of the high schools, maybe not. Uh, there are some exceptional high schools out there that do a really, really good job with that. But there are just so many different ways that you can get involved that really support and improve the program. Now, on the student side itself, if you're going in and you're talking to the class, make sure what you're talking about is relevant to that age bracket. If you're going in and talking to eighth graders or freshmen, uh, younger 
folks, they might not care as much about benefits, right? They, they, might not even know what benefits are at that point. So being able to just talk to them about the, the cool opportunities in the industry, just know your audience, right? When you're going in to talk to them, shop tours are fantastic. Make sure you give your team a heads up when you're giving them a shop tour, because if all of a sudden there's just a bunch of, of students walking around the shop, they might be a little confused, but if you can give them a heads up and then maybe help them help educate them on the need to be friendly and warm to the students as they're coming through, uh, making sure that their their work areas are cleaned up. Just uh, make sure that it's impressive when you're bringing the students through. Uh, tools and equipment to learn on. Uh, I think a lot of times I, I see schools all the time asking for alignment machines. So if you're maybe going and you're upgrading your alignment machine or one of your alignment machines, uh, do, look at donating that to a, a program because that could still be really, really helpful for them. And even if it's outdated for you, it still teaches the principles of alignments with a machine that can be really helpful. Internships, part-time or full-time work for students. There are a lot of students looking for this. Uh, I think one of the cool parts about Wrenchway is that maybe you can stand out to that student in a way that uh, right now, if a student goes in, uh, if, if a student doesn't know, or if their parent or teacher doesn't know somebody in your dealership, the chances that they're actually going to walk in your doors and say, hey, you know what, I'd like, I'd like an internship or I'd like a job shadow opportunity. They're just not going to do it. Like I wouldn't have done that when I was 18. I wouldn't have walked into a dealership and just freely asked for any of that. Uh, event participants, uh, we put down career fairs, mock interviews, and fundraisers. One of the things that I'll say there is that uh, it, so many are looking for help with Skills USA, right? So get out there, try to help support uh, and judge, if you can, a Skills USA competition. And then lastly, scholarships. They're always looking for scholarships. Yeah. Sorry, that I, was very wordy. <laughs> it's good information, though. It's good content. Um, as you were as you were talking about the student experience and the guest speakers, uh, I was kind of reflecting on um, when my time at Ford, I was doing some uh, career days with the Ford dealers in the area, and I did I brought in some of the field service engineers with me on a couple of them, and I thought that was a cool experience. It was a different vantage point, right? So it's like if you can involve other people that have a slightly different uh, you know opinion than service manager, they may see a lot of service managers. If you have anybody else at your dealership that can share a different opinion. Opinion. Um, guest speakers like that, that could be a really good way to get people involved. And I also think that the job shadowing is a great way to help people level up too, right? Like you say, just, you know, uh, tours of the, the building is awesome. But if you do have a job shadow, that kind of gives that tech that ability to advance their career a little bit. Think about how they're doing good for the community and things like that. Um, and then I also want to call attention to Brian in the chat too. He had a great comment on getting the parents involved. And Jay, you kind of mentioned that too, but I think the more you can get parents involved in this stuff, like the better chances you have to uh, sway an opinion, right? Parents have a, a big opinion on what happens in their kids' lives in those those key years of the, the teens. So do things for the parents. Educational things for the parents is also an awesome idea. I love that you called out that comment. I was reading that. I'm like, that. that is so perfect, Brian. Yeah, that was great. Um, okay, so case studies. And we kind of talked about some case studies already, some examples and everything, but I'm excited to to have you run through a couple more specific examples too. Yeah, I'll try so not to get our... too wordy with these. Uh, <laughs> but uh, just some really, really cool things that we've, uh, some examples that have happened through School Assist. Uh, the first one is one of my favorites, Jefferson High School uh, received a bunch of airbags. I think it was like 30 or 40 airbags that were sitting on the shelf at one of the dealerships. That's a client of ours. And uh, they posted that they were giving away these airbags. And within, within an hour, uh, the Jefferson High School teacher had already reached out or, or said that they would like the, the airbags. They had never talked before. The dealership in the school had never talked before, even though they were 20 minutes away from each other. And what happened was they were able to put together a cool exercise where they blow up the airbags and all the, the kids go crazy. And it was just a really cool thing for the students to see. But then also it was kind of that segue to a relationship from the dealership to the school and really just kind of an extension of that olive branch to, to make it okay to talk to them, right? So that was really cool. Uh, Hartford Union High School is another school that has had a bunch of stuff donated to them. They're a great program. And so many of the local shops in that area have really taken an active interest in their program. 
And we are making a stronger program as a result. And when I say we, us as an industry, like this is a better program because the industry is involved. So I, I love, love seeing those scenarios. Um, the next, uh, if we can go to the next slide, and I'll try to get through these fairly quickly. Uh, North Kansas City schools, uh, they needed speakers for a conference they were putting on for students to help educate them about the automotive industry. A dealer rep that was about an hour away uh, went and actually talked to this program. So that was that was really cool to see that. And, and really somebody from uh, the dealership took the initiative to go out of their way, go in their busy day, go talk to a class. Um, and ultimately, I think the last uh, the last picture there is just another uh, school that has had a lot of activity on school assist, and it's cool. I think for me, that's what it's all about. It's about seeing these relationships. It's about seeing these programs get the support they need, and ultimately, these students getting exposure to this wonderful industry we're in. So, I uh, just so many cool stories have come out of this. It's very heartwarming for me. I, I, I love seeing all of this. I was going to say, I'm a, I'm a sucker for really happy things. You catch me crying at all the sporting events, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. But I mean, that's what's so cool about this stuff is you can really make an impact on people's lives if you catch them at the right time and you you set a good example. So I love that. Um, this okay, is exciting. Cool. I This is exciting. <laughs> I'm not going to cry over this one, but yeah, this is exciting. So I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give my two cents on this, but this is coming out on Monday, September 16th. So this upcoming Monday, um, like I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, Hyrology and Wrenchway have partnered together since April. And um, this is one of the new features that we're going to be launching for our mutual customers. So as a reminder, you do need to have a Wrenchway account. You need to have a Hyrology account and any of our mutual customers will get this benefit. Um, and essentially, you can kind of see over on the left hand side of the screen, there's a little pop up there that says help schools in Michigan. So if you are a mutual customer, you're going to see something like this pop up on your Hyrology account um, in the next week or so. And it's essentially going to prompt you to help your local school. So if you've forgotten who's in your area, you're not already involved with them, this is going to be um, an easy way to uh, get a reminder to pop back in and, and start helping. So hopefully you'll see that starting next week. Um, and yeah, we're excited. We're excited to launch more stuff like this for our mutual customers too down the road, just some reminders on how to work with local schools, get involved in, in things like that. Yeah, I'm pumped. I think that's such a cool tool. Hopefully, as you're logging into Hyrology and you see that prompt, make sure you click on the button because I, I do think it, getting visibility to the schools is so important. And, and if you can do it in a streamlined fashion, I think it helps everybody out. So uh, we appreciate Hyrology for including us on uh, their pages because I do think it's, it, it is just vital to our industry. So uh, much appreciated, Hyrology. Oh, Love to love to do it. Um, and with that, we do have a couple questions that I'm going to loop back to. Um, but you can see my information and also Jay's information up on the screen. Um, feel free to note that down if you have any questions that we didn't get to. Um, but Brian asked a question. He says, to clarify, Hyrology is in Canada, but Wrenchway is it not. Does that mean that the school's portion of your program is on the Wrenchway side, only not on Hyrology, correct? And that's correct, Brian. Um, Wrenchway, Hyrology, two separate um, subscriptions. And the school assist will only be on the Wrenchway side. Hyrology is in Canada. <laughs> um, second question from Michelle. If we have a Wrenchway account set up, do we have access to the school assist? You do, yes. That actually comes with uh, with your membership. And if you have any questions about how to access it, uh, feel free to reach out. But when you log into Wrenchway, uh, you'll see a school assist tab that you can click on. And there's some different filtering that you can do to get to where you need to get to, but uh, you do have access to it. Correct. Okay. And then one more for us. So this is a, I love this one. What metrics should employers use to evaluate the success of their partnerships with local auto programs? It's question That's one. That's a good one. I know. Yeah. I, I like that Can we one. start on that one first? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. So for me, there are some obvious ones that are more of the tangible, I got a student out of this program each year. And I, I think when we talk about moving your focus from being really focused on that student to being focused on that school, then it kind of moves into maybe some more of the intangible territory where some of it is a little bit of a gut feel in seeing that, hey, you know what? This program, and honestly, this is a tangible stat, and I love watching this, is 
What is enrollment? Is the program full of students? No. Okay. So what are we doing next year to make sure that program is full of students? I think where industry can really help out is that a lot of these, especially at the tech school level, they don't like recruiting students, right? They didn't sign up to be recruiters. They signed up to be teachers. And so maybe if you can partner with your local tech school and say, hey, we'll go out to that high school and we'll help you get more students into that program, just give us the resources to be able to, to really kind of create that path. Uh, I think you you do a lot of favors for that school. But uh, when you look at those metrics and you're trying to evaluate the success, that's an area where I think you need to look at the program and honestly having in, uh, conversations with the instructors and asking them asking them that very same question, I think can be really, really impactful because then you're truly trying to understand what the goals of that program are, not necessarily just your business. Yeah. And I think even simplifying it even a little bit more, the first thing that comes to mind is if you're trying to evaluate the success of the, your partnership with a local school, start to tally the different things that you're doing, right? Keep track of that. Like how many times you went out to volunteer, uh, you sat on a panel, how many times you donated some, like start to tally up those things and then see what you get in return, right? It's not quick. It's sometimes that stuff is, it's hard for me to keep track of that stuff over time, right? You lose track of it. Um, so write it down. And then at the end of the year, see how many students you talk to right? Like just basic ROI type metrics of like, what energy did you put in? How many students did you get out? How many opportunities down the road could you have something like that? So I think that that's a pretty good way to start um, seeing how it works. And then the second part of that question is what emerging skills or technologies should employers be aware of when partnering with local automotive programs? Stephanie's asking some great questions here. Thank you, Stephanie. I think when you're looking at it, it might break, I'll break it down to high school and uh, post-secondary tech school. So emerging skills, I think something to almost be aware of, and I've seen this with some of the high school programs, is that they're trying to jump from no skill level to advanced diagnostics really, really fast. And so when I when I talk to schools, I really, really encourage them focus on the basics. Can they read a tape measure? Can they use a screwdriver? Can they, can they do some of this really, really simple stuff? And it sounds terrible to maybe break it down to that, that really elementary level. But in talking with instructors, there are a lot of students that just don't have much background on this. And we have to get them skilled up enough to where when they do go to a tech school program, or maybe they go directly to work for you, that they have some basic skills. So that that would be one thing that I, if if you're out there, you're talking to an instructor or to a program, maybe you're on that advisory committee meeting in a, in a high school level, uh, is to maybe get them to pump the brakes a little bit, because sometimes we're trying to jump too far forward when we really need to be foc focused on the core skills of that student. Uh, with the, the tech schools, I think uh, emerging skills, it's interesting. And when you, when you listen to what they're doing with curriculum, they're trying to fit a lot of curriculum into a two-year program, right? And even more into a one-year program. And so as you're seeing that, you, you might see that, hey, they're taking out the transmission rebuilding class to sub in for a battery technology class. Uh, I think they're trying to meet the demand of what the industry has in terms of that, that EV shift or hybrid shift, or de depending on what that technology is, you can see it in how they lay out their curriculum. Uh, and most of the time, even if you don't make it to the advisory committee meeting, so if you have a school that you're on the advisory board for, they'll still send you the minutes of what was talked about. Make sure that you're reading through that because that will that will cue you off on some of that. So uh, for the technology side, I think I could have an entirely different discussion on that, but in the, in the, uh, uh, I guess, respective time, I'll, I'll maybe, uh, take that one on the side, Stephanie. Cool. Um, well, we are a minute or two over here. So thank you all for joining us. We appreciate the time you spent. And like we said, uh, you will get a recording of the, of the call and you'll also get the deck. Um, and thanks for joining. Have a great rest of your Thursday. <laughs> thank you, everybody. <laughs>